Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 12th annual UC Davis Pre-Health Student Alliance. My name is Pachia Ashley Zhang, and I'm a keynote staff volunteer. I would like to start by thanking the AAMC and other sponsors for supporting us through the development of this year's conference. Dr. Jonathan Eisen is an evolutionary biologist interested in the origin of new processes and functions in living things. His research is based on analyzing the genomes of microbes using phylogenetic analysis. His contributions in biology have earned him significant re recognition in the scientific community. He was awarded the Benjamin Franklin Award in Bioinformatics Walter J. Gores Award and was also elected as a fellow of the American Society for Microbiology. In addition to that, he has worked as, a, as an investigator at the Institute for Genomic Research before becoming a faculty member at UC Davis. He is one of the few scientists that are able to captivate a mass audience, whether through his TED talks or other means of social media. Please welcome Dr. Jonathan Eisen. All right, uh, I'm local in town and it's still early in the morning for me, so if uh, you're like traveling from far away, I, I apologize. Um, and uh, it's not a huge crowd right here, so truly stop me anytime along the way if you wanna ask a question about anything I'm talking about. Um, they're not gonna be like deep scientific data presented here, but um, anyway, please holler and shout. Uh, so what I want to talk about is a couple of different issues related to um, my career and that relate to some of the themes of this conference and some other things that I would like you to, to think about and as you proceed in um, going into vari uh, any of the health uh, careers that you're thinking about. And so what I want to start with is a very recent story. Um, I was uh, at a conference that I actually helped co-organize, a uh, conference on microbial sequencing, using DNA sequencing to study microbes. And it was up at this UCLA conference center in the mountains east of LA, a place called Lake Arrowhead. Uh, really nice setting. I've been going to this meeting since I was a graduate student, actually, in 1998. So um, it's fun to go back to the meeting and to be involved in it. And um, since this is a a health gathering here. I figure um, it's okay for me to tell you that I'm a type one diabetic. I have an insulin pump um, delivering insulin into me. Uh, wonderful thing most of the time. Uh, life can get a little challenging when you travel, when you're really busy, when you're organizing a conference and you're distracted. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not me, but I got at this conference a cellulitis infection at the insulin pump site and it was freaking me out. Um, and the conference had like 17 talks on the emergence of antibiotic resistance uh, and various hospital-borne infections and other horrible things that microbes can do to you. And here I am in my room, you know, with a fever and the growing cellulitis and, you know, not happy. Um, and fortunately, I got in contact with my doctor. Um, I actually had an emergency supply of antibiotics with me that I carry with me on trips. And we decided to go ahead and take uh, the antibiotics. Um, and I took the antibiotics and then, of course, uh, you, you all probably do this too, at, you know, at two in the morning in my room at this uh, conference center, I started to freak out about, you know, am I having side effects? Am I, you know, what's going on here? Um, and I couldn't get in touch with my doctor, but we have this wonderful thing called PubMed. Um, so I got out my computer and I started searching PubMed for things like Bactrim and, you know, uh, side effects and other such things. And I found a paper that seemed really interesting and worth digging into. And I got to the relevant paper site, and then I hit what's known as a paywall. Um, that is, I could only get access to the paper if I paid, in this case, $89 to just look at the paper. And I didn't even know if it was going to be relevant to you know, what was going on in my particular system. And this, this is just you know, completely absurd. Um, and this is not a new uh, experience for me. Um, getting these paywalls. Uh, it's a common thing. In fact, you could call it a disease. It's not really a new disease, but it's a, a disease that I will call closed accessitis. Um, or for those of you who are familiar with some of the scientific and medical publishing, I also call it Elseviritis. <laughs> um, and this was infuriating. Here I am at a conference on antibiotic resistant, you know, resistance and the use of antibiotics to treat microbial infections. 
I wanted to read the latest paper on the topic, um, and I couldn't get access to it. And I, you know, it's just in incredibly infuriating. And um, but again, as I mentioned, this is not a new thing. This is a disease that has been known for many, many years. And in fact, I have been involved in a movement that has been trying to cure us, uh, our community, the scientific and medical community of this uh, closed accessitis. And I'm going to tell you a little story about that. Um, in 2000, three scientists, Harold Varmus, who was then the head of the NIH, Pat Brown, who was a professor at Stanford, um, and Michael Eisen, who happens to be my brother, um, who was a postdoc with Pat Brown, were trying to gather up information about some new genomic-y types of experiments and share them with the world, and they ran into this same closed accessitis problem that I was pointing out. And they actually decided to do something about it. Um, and what they did was they created a group called the Public Library of Science, whose mission was to try and um, cure our world of this disease of closed accessitis. They wrote a letter. Um, you don't have to read all the letter here. They sent this letter around to a lot of people and asked them to sign it. The key parts of this letter are here. Um, to create the establishment of an online public library with the full contents of the published record. And in addition, the people who would sign this letter pledged that they would only publish in journals that were open and freely available. And they would not work for, not review for, not be involved in at all journals that did otherwise. Uh, this seemed like a good thing. Um, they got a lot of people to sign, including me. Um, you know, uh, my brother asked me if I could sign and I couldn't really say no. Um, but I wasn't completely convinced in the importance of this mission at the time. But you know, I, he's my older brother too. So um, anyway, in particular, actually, I worked at this, as was mentioned in the introduction, I worked at this place called Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research, which pioneered genome sequencing before I got there, mind you. But they pioneered genome sequencing. And it was um, the ch Head of the board of Tiger was Craig Venter, the person who then went on to start sequencing the human genome, sort of the, the biggest celebrity scientist we have around. And my brother had written me this email, not asking if I could sign the petition, but if I could get Craig um, to sign the petition, because that would be a big statement about openness, which I, I never managed to do. But, um, but I did sign it, and actually 25,000 people signed this letter. Everybody saying they were going to support open access, and it had almost no effect. And so what Harold Varmus, Pat Brown, and my brother did as the second thing of the Public Library of Science was they decided to create new journals that would allow people to publish their material in a completely open manner where you could not only get access to the papers, but use the papers for any purpose that you wanted, so-called open access publishing. And they started a couple of journals, PLOS Biology and PLOS Medicine. I actually joined the editorial board of PLOS Biology. Again, you know, my brother asked me about it. I wasn't, it sounded like an important thing to have access to the literature, but I didn't completely understand the point of this. I um, decided like a good scientist to experiment with openness to see what the benefits and risks could be. So I started for projects that I was running publishing the papers in an open manner and releasing the data in an open manner even before we published. We would post the data to various open archives and let anybody use the data in any way they wanted, even possibly scooping us on scientific publications. This never caused us a problem. It always led to a benefit to our projects. Um, again, I thought this was useful, but I wasn't completely convinced of the righteousness of this approach until real life intervened. Um, my wife, who had worked at this uh, same institute where I had worked, got pregnant. Um, and uh, in the course of the pregnancy, we discovered that she had a couple of medical complications going on. Um, the pregnancy uh, was not going very well, and she was in the hospital actually across the street from Tiger. And at 3 in the morning, I went back to Tiger to try and get access to some papers that were relevant to her medical treatment. In particular, we were interested at the time in ROGAM immunization for the RH positive mixing of blood, which had probably happened during the course of the problems that she was having in the pregnancy. Um, and our doctors did not know, had not given the ROGAM immunization, and it was now a week after the mixing of the blood, and the general recommendation was to do the ROGAM immunization after three days. So I wanted to read the literature to find out whether or not anybody had studied what happens after a week 
as opposed to what happens after three days. So I logged on to, you know, it was probably a modem at the time um, or uh, some other way to get access to the literature. Again, a PubMed search, found a paper of relevance, and hit a paywall. You have to pay $30 to get access to this paper. Um, you know, frustrated. We had to make a decision within, you know, eight hours as to what to do. And I couldn't get access to the paper. By the way, I sent out messages to like 17 hematologists that I knew as well. This was not the only thing we were doing, but I also wanted to look at the literature myself. Here's another paper. Oh, you gotta pay for it too. Dozens and dozens of papers I bought at three in the morning trying to figure out what to do with this Rogam immunization. I tried to contact experts. I tried to get papers from people's websites and generally ran into a wall. And now I finally realized what Harold Varmus and Pat Brown and my brother had been talking about. I was absolutely pissed off. I couldn't believe that our government had paid for this research, had paid for it to transform medical treatment. And here I was, an informed member of the public who wanted to get access to this literature and couldn't. It's ridiculous. Um, I'm sad to say that uh, what we did did not help. I'm not sure that uh, anything we could have done uh, would have helped, but we lost the baby uh, eventually in, in this um, sort of horrible month-long series of, of problems. Uh, I don't think it, you know, we could have rescued it by doing the Rogam immunization on time, but in the course of this, I just became so infuriated. So I dedicated myself at that moment to the movement to open up scientific and medical literature, scientific and medical data, scientific and medical tools to the broader community. Now, I might mention, um, I was working at a research institute with 300 people. We were doing cutting edge genome sequencing. Again, this is the place that invented the field. But we didn't have a big library budget. We had subscriptions to nothing. We weren't at a university like UC Davis. If you log on to PubMed right now through the wireless, you can get access to lots of literature because UC Davis and the UC has paid millions of dollars to get access to that literature. But if you're at a small, cutting edge research institute, you don't have access to that literature. And if you're a member of the public, forget it. You don't have access to anything if it's behind a paywall. So that became a mission of my life uh, to get rid of closed accessitis. Uh, in some way, although I note it's still pretty prevalent. So for example, on Friday, that would be two days ago, a bunch of stories came out in news sources reporting on a cure for diabetes, a potential cure for type 1 diabetes. Again, you know, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, connected to my pump, getting cellulitis infections once every three or four years. Uh, the cure to diabetes could be a nice thing um, until you dig into the details, uh, alas. Um, so I went and found, this was based upon a study from Harvard, from a wonderful uh, scientist, Doug Melton, who has made it his life mission to cure diabetes because his two children have been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. He does wonderful stuff. Um, unfortunately, he and Harvard and associates oversold this paper. Um, and I wanted to get access to the paper to blog about it, to try and control the tide of hype going on about this uh, paper. And I was uh, out. You know, I think at my son's soccer game or soccer practice on my phone, and I got to the paper and again hit a paywall, $31 to pay for access to this paper that supposedly is going to report information on curing diabetes. And again, just so pissed off about this. I said some things on Twitter that probably weren't very nice or certainly weren't very nice, um, but I decided that this was unacceptable that if we were going to have uh, cover stories in all these newspapers about curing diabetes, everyone should have access to this paper. Um, it turns out that the scientist behind this works for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. That's who funds his work. They actually have been one of the great organizations responding to the push for ending closed accessitis. Uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute supports open access. They say that they encourage all their people to publish in an open manner. Um, but alas, the paper was not published in an open manner and I went after them on Twitter. Um, again, not very politely. And amazingly, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute responded within a few hours, got the scientists to post a copy of the paper on his website,
to make it freely available to everybody. And now I've been posting links to that paper on every site that is of interest to anybody so that anybody can get access to this paper and read more about how unfortunately it does not report on a cure for type 1 diabetes. It's fascinating stem cell work, but not quite what the news stories were saying. So there it is. You can download it uh, from their site. Um, so again, do we have a cure for um, closed accessitis, uh, cell accessitis, um, that's the journal that this was published in. Um, I don't think we have a cure yet, but I'm hopeful in part because of that Howard Hughes response and because many people are growing more appreciative of the need for this uh, openness. What is the cure? The cure is to start out when you do a scientific or medical or any other scholarly type of project with the goal of making the results of your project freely, that is at no charge, and openly, that is with no restrictions, available to everyone in the community. And that's how we are going to transform um, medicine and science uh, in the future. Now, um, we have to return to this story, right? I'm logging on, looking for papers about antibiotics treatment and resistance to antibiotics and what you know, Bactrim does when you go out in the sun. I think that was one of the things I was concerned about. I was going for like a six hour hike the next day and I'd heard that Bactrim, you know, they recommend you stay out of the sun and I wasn't gonna do that, so I wanted to know what I was up against. Um, so a related topic to this um, and a reason I was concerned about taking the Bactrim is what I do in my work, in my research, in my lab, is I study the diversity of microbes on the planet. Microbes in oceans, microbes in soil, microbes in air, microbes in a variety of places. And I do that because, well, microbes are really cool. Um, okay, I'm a dork. But, um, uh, and because microbes basically run the planet. They run the global nutrient cycles throughout the planet. They do all sorts of interesting things. They're found all throughout our built environment, which is not uh, uh, much appreciated, although now with the Ebola outbreak, people are starting to think more about you know, what's in airports, for example. Um, and of relevance to human medicine, as well as animal medicine and agriculture, most all multicellular organisms are covered in a cloud of microbes. The vast majority of these microbes that we are covered in do not make us sick. I mean, I got this cellulitis, who knows, it's probably Staphylococcus aureus. Um, occasionally there's a pathogen in and on you and we can transmit pathogens and the pathogens freak us out, right? Ebola, um, anthrax, tuberculosis, malaria, they're really scary. Um, medical, veterinary, and other sort of science has focused on those pathogens to try and kill them. Antibiotics are amazing things, saving millions of lives all the time. But they also are basically the equivalent of clear-cutting a forest. The community of microbes that lives in and on you, most of them are harmless, many of them are beneficial, and only occasionally is there a bad one around. So when you treat yourself or a patient or a dog or a cat um, with antibiotics, you are getting rid of that microbial diversity. You might solve the short-term problem, but you may create a long-term problem. And now, in the last 10 years, there's been a growing appreciation of the risks that come with messing with the colonization and transmission of microbes in people and in plants and animals. So if you take antibiotics as a young child, that increases the risk of a variety of ailments, allergy, asthma, autoimmune disease, obesity, and a variety of other problems that is thought now to be due to devastating the microbial communities that live in and on you, which in turn sets up your immune system for developing slightly wrong, which then leads to long-term problems like inflammation. So we're covered in this cloud of microbes, we kill them with antibiotics, but we, and that can be very beneficial, but we also vastly overuse the antimicrobial compounds that we can potentially use to save lives in the world around us. Antimicrobials, antibiotics, and other chemicals that are targeting microbes for killing or slowing or destruction are in everything. I'm sure you've heard about the recent stories where people have been very concerned about the overuse of antibiotics in agriculture, in chicken farms, in cattle farms, in pig farms. Um, in some of them, 
There's more antibiotic use in those places than there are in infectious disease wards in a hospital. And when you pump a cattle community or a chicken community full of antibiotics, you do two things. You lead to an increase in the probability of emergence of antibiotic resistance, and you also slaughter the beneficial microbes at the same time as killing potential pathogens in those communities. There's antimicrobials in clothing, in car seats, in walls, in kitchen counters, in toothpaste, in everything around us people are trying to promote the use of these antimicrobials because germs are evil. They will kill you. And so people are trying to get, you know, marketing products based upon how they get rid of microbes. And that's generally not a good thing. I won't talk in detail about this, but I would recommend that wherever you go in your medical field, whether it's pharmacy or veterinary health or medicine or basic research or any other area, that you think about the microbial communities in and on plants, animals, and people as an ecosystem. And you think about how you're basically burning down the entire ecosystem to treat one problem. That doesn't mean you shouldn't treat bad infections with antibiotics, but it means that you should think about the effects of those antimicrobials and how to restore the microbial community before and after you use those antimicrobial compounds. Uh, this is a shirt that I uh, have made and now you can buy on Zazzle. If you do good on this, I will give you a Guardian of Microbial Diversity Award. Um, in my blog, uh, it says proud to be a GMD on the front of the shirt, and the drawings are by my kids uh, of what they think microbes are. Um, and you should all become a guardian of microbial diversity. And that um, leads me to the last topic that I want to talk about, which is of direct relevance to this meeting. So in my research life, I focus almost entirely on the potential benefits of diversity to ecosystems, to plants and animals, how a diversity of functions in a community can make it more stable and more robust, better respond to perturbations, um, have a lot better long-term health. I think the same is true in science. The more diversity that we have in science, in STEM fields of um, students, of researchers, of uh, administrators, of reporters, of anybody involved in the whole enterprise, the better off we're going to be. And I'm going to return now to that Lake Arrowhead conference. As I mentioned, I've been going to this conference since I was a graduate student in 1998. In 2002, I had a transformative moment, sort of like the experience with not being able to access the literature. This, um, I was outside at the conference. I can't go to too many talks at a meeting, so I skipped a few of the talks, and I was outside in the grassy field next to the pool, and there was this relatively young woman there with a little two- or three-year-old kid, and I went over to her and I said, oh, are you also skipping the talks? Um, and she said, no, 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 uh, I'm here as a nanny for one of the graduate students who's here for the meeting. And Joe Handelsman, who was at the meeting, was a professor at Wisconsin running a, a program to improve diversity in STEM fields. She had created a fund for graduate students to apply to if they had kids that would pay for the travel and um, hourly fee for a nanny to go with them to a conference so that they could attend all the talks. And I was just completely floored by this. Here was a problem that someone had identified, prob, you know, challenge of graduate students who have children going to conferences, and an actual solution that she had implemented. And I was inspired by this in a brief interaction with that one student. I became, so Joe Handelsman also works in my field of studying microorganisms and their uh, diversity in the environment. I had heard of her but never met her, um, but I've now uh, communicated with her extensively about diversity in science as well as microbiology. And I've gotten involved in many projects, uh, some you know, big, some small, that relate to increasing the hiring, retention, promotion, training, um, and activity of women and underrepresented minorities in STEM fields. Uh, by the way, Joe Handelsman, who is a great um, microbiologist has now been stolen. Um, she has now become the deputy director uh, of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, so hopefully they will be doing more related to diversity in STEM. Um, 
And what I would like to say, just like with being a guardian of microbial diversity, just like with um, open access and open science, uh, there are many things you can do that anyone can do that can improve the diversity that we see in STEM fields. One thing that I do now is I refuse to give talks at meetings that don't have a good diversity of speakers. Um, and I think uh, people should consider doing that. You should also encourage um, in every way that you can um, to have an increased diversity uh, in STEM fields, again, at every level, from the young student to the senior professor. And so what I would like to end with um, is just the recommendation as you go forth in your careers, as you engage in something that you're interesting, interested in, there's lots of amazing stuff to do in science right now, in medicine, in veterinary medicine, in pharmacy areas. It's a really exciting time. At the same time that you do something that you're really interested in, you can change the world. You can make the world a better place for science, for scientists, and for the broader community. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has any. Um, I know it's early, so yeah. What is the excuse for a couple of these articles being more expensive than a subscription to the magazine? So um, the subscriptions to those magazines are actually much higher than you would imagine. So the one that was $89.95, I went and looked, and the subscription that they charge libraries is something on the order of $15,000 a year. Um, and so what many of these journals do is they offer reduced prices for individual subscriptions and memberships. And you know, I, I believe in scientific societies need our support. Some of them do amazing things. And so I actually subscribe to a reasonable number of journals when there's a reasonable price for them. I don't mind paying for some of the front matter that is produced in those journals and the good things that happen at conferences. But in terms of the individual costs, I've tried, I've actually started to submit freedom of information requests to some of these organizations to try and find out how many people actually pay those fees. Is that fee there just to you know, make it obvious that no one should get this without paying a subscription, or do people actually pay those fees? And I have no idea how many people pay those fees. Yeah? Yeah. So the question is, have I ever tried sort of Googling the article and the title to try and find online PDFs? So Google Scholar is a great place to do this now because they sort of archive all of the possible links to publications. And I think that that can be useful. I would like to implement a legal way for everyone to do that. So it turns out that that is, many of those postings on individual scientists' websites are in ex explicit violation of the agreements that they sign to publish those papers. And I'm happy that they do that, but I do not, I wanna find a way that we can make this material open and legal. All right, thank you very much.